coming up on Push to Talk. Destiny 2 loot, Sekiro's difficulty, early impressions on The Division 2, the reveal of Darkborn, and the Kotaku Anthem Exposé. Enjoy! Hello and welcome to Push to Talk, episode 18 for April 9th, 2019. I'm your host, Chalk One, alongside Rumpo, as always. It's been a while, lots of things have changed. It's been almost three years since episode 17, and we'll get into why it's been so long in a little bit. But the first thing I want to say is that we've grown up a little bit, so we're going to ditch the nicknames Chalk One and Rumpo, and we're actually going to go with real names. Uh, for those that don't know, I'm Jan and Rumpo. You are Bill, always have I been. I am Bill, always have been. Yep, we just never really went with that, but we decided, you know what, it's been three years, we're older, I have a lot more gray hair, uh, we might as well step it up a bit. How you been? Yeah, uh, I've been good, man. Um, busy, maybe, but one of those things where I never really know what's been keeping me busy. Um, how have you been? I've been busy as well, and, and, and quite good as well. We should point out that this isn't like we haven't talked in three years. We have, as a matter of fact, worked on projects together, played lots of Ooh. games together. We but, didn't um, have a creative falling out and then ignore each other, and this is like getting the band back together? Like, no. we hugged it out? Okay. No, right. it's not. We just, at some point, I think, Push to Talk just kind of fell by the wayside in between all the, probably Destiny is to blame for a lot of it, um, and, and various work projects got in the way. We're, we're not even on the same Destiny game as the last time we recorded a podcast. Interestingly enough, though, we still have the same gripes. I think we're going to talk about some of them later. Yes. Yes, we've had plenty of discussions about destiny and the universe as a whole. So I guess that's what's been up for three years is we've just been griping about destiny. Maybe there's probably a little bit more depth to uh, what's been happening in our lives since then, but that's that's a, that's a mainstay. Yeah, there's there's other things. We know we we built a website, we ran a website, we sold a website, we still work for websites. I mean, this is your job, anyways. You're at yeah. uh, what websites do you work for? Give us a list because it's a, it's several. Oh, goodness. Uh, the way I try to phrase it, uh, the, the website that I work for is uh, Shack News. So shacknews.com. Um, and I'm just shy, just shy of two years there. Um, but other than that, uh, I, I work for Greenlit, which is a content creation company. And there's just a bunch of websites that Greenlit handles for, you know, internally and clients. And, you know, so I work on lots of websites in that manner. But um, I prefer to look at it as I... If I had to identify with a website, it would be Shack News, right. professionally. Yes. So we've been exposed to lots of games over the past few years. We've definitely stayed in the know. Um, created a website together called TLDR Games, which we ran for a year and a half or so, 18 months. Um, and then we've moved on to just playing games again. And we decided, you know what, it's time to talk about them again, because we like talking about games. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's weird. Uh the podcast has always been something that we've done when we had like a, I guess maybe a creative lull, if you will. Um, Cause you and I over the years, probably for more than 10 years have always done something, maybe not together, but you know, individually or with other people, we've always done something. And if we hit a period of a few months where not a lot's happening, you know, or it's slow times and we're like, Hey, we should do a podcast seems to be our, our go-to. Yeah, it's true. I don't know why that is, but it was kind of convenient because obviously Push to Talk never really went away. The website stayed up. We're still on iTunes. Um, anybody that's still subscribed is still subscribed. And what's funny is um, when I put out a tweet on the uh, at Push to Talk FM Twitter account uh, a couple of weeks ago, sort of teasing a return and asking a question that we'll talk about later in our hashtag Push to Talk segment, we actually got some replies. So it was kind of nice to see that people hadn't totally forgotten about us, which I totally would have excused them to. If, you know, I mean, we kind of just went poof, gone, two and a half years, but. Yeah, and I really don't remember why that happened. Um, so I haven't prepared a, you know, a good excuse for why we went dark like that. But anyway, it's, we did. We did, but we should also mention that we brought some reinforcements to keep us on the ball this time around. Uh, really what I'm talking about is somebody that's going to do all the hard work and the heavy lifting. And you heard his voice at the beginning of the podcast, just before the intro, which he also concocted. And I want to introduce you all to our new third host, Joe. Hey, Joe, how's it going? Hey, Jan. Good. I'm very good. Glad to be here. 
and uh, excited to inherit the lengthy, robust 17 episode lineage <laughs> <laughs> that you have so kindly laid the groundwork for before I. It is a very critical legacy that is now in your hands. So, yeah, I imagine, you know, as you mentioned, I intend to do some of the heavy lifting, although I, I hope that, you know, neither of you discount your efforts here. You'll be writing blurbs, which may amount to three sentences to four sentences per show. I mean, that's not nothing. I'm joking. This is true. You know, that's something <laughs> I explicitly call life. <laughs> three sentences to four sentences. I'm like, that, that's a strap line, man. Come on. <laughs> I'll do us better than that. I don't want to do it, though. So I'm very happy for either of you. to oh, Okay, that that's fair. And I don't want to do the heavy lifting as 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 Jan will tell you in everything that we ever do. <laughs> one thing we should point out is that in our effort to make this return a triumphant one and actually be consistent, these episodes will be released every Tuesday in the morning sometime. Let's call it 10 a.m. Pacific time, just because that seems to be a popular reset slash release cycle for games. So we might as well tag on to that. So we are going to do this weekly, every Tuesday, unless something really terrible happens or we get you know really sucked into a game. But that's the plan. So now that we've sort of split up the work between the three of us, I think we'll be successful. Hope so. And we're also going to start off this episode, as all future episodes, with a new segment that we call Top Stories. And I'm going to toss this right over to you, Joe. Um, what the point of this is, is we're just going to discuss some of the top stories that we've come across in the past week. So if you want to lead us into what you think your top story of the past seven days was. Sure. So um, I'm, going to, I'm going to say I'm going to look to Bill to, to co-op this top story of mine. And also, like I cannot believe this is the past seven days. And that's how fast I think... We're all moving where this feels like last month, but um, over on Kotaku, Jason Trier um, sort of got into the nitty gritty of really what went wrong over at Bioware uh, on on the Anthem project over the past seven years. And um, I know I'm not the only one that found it extremely interesting and also maybe disheartening about, uh, I guess, I guess what I find disheartening is that, you know, this is what major publishers are pushing for this type of game and i know you know you guys started out today's show by saying you still have the same gripes with destiny you know what is it about these types of games that in my opinion are shoved down our throats and yet can't seem to be pulled off by the best of the best developers out there um so it was it was interesting hearing uh or reading uh, schreier's take and sort of him showing that you know you need to have pre-production and many many years before a game is shipped especially a game like this for something remotely good to be the finished product and uh yeah that's what i thought was so interesting i, I don't know bill if, if if any one thing in in his piece stuck out to you but um for me it was it was um a familiar notion having worked at many jobs in the past 15 years of you know the ideation and the and the um, the loosey goosey creative thinking that that can uh, occur without some some wrangling for that to be the main culprit of why the thing went south. Yeah, there was there was a lot of layers to this for me. Um, it wasn't just one thing; it was sort of one after another after another. Um, one of them being that the amount of pressure that the employees were under. The first thing that I thought, and it was kind of confirmed, I think, in a follow up tweet the next day or two after, um, was that developers continued reaching out and saying you could just replace bioware with our studio and the piece would be perfectly like it would be accurate still so this is a very widespread thing right this isn't just a bioware thing um at least from an employee health standpoint it's not just a bioware thing um and that i that doesn't surprise me at all um i we're on the outside but there's definitely been this sense that there's an awful lot of grinding and extremely long hours and high pressure going into uh, these studios and developers and games. Um, and the second layer of this for me was more or less just, I, I've, I kind of expected, like when you talk about big games, like when you talk about any big game, like a Destiny or an Anthem or anything, you just assume that, like you said, that's the best of the best, and it is the best of the best, but... It was very weird to me 
to find out that there was like a lack of organization and leadership and direction there. Like, how does that happen? Yeah. I guess um, that's what caught me off guard was the idea that something that they were selling as bet you can't wait for this amazing game and this is going to be an incredible experience and et cetera, et cetera. And behind the scenes, it was just, just a complete mess. Um, and that was weird to me. Like I expected the pressure on the developers, on the employees. Um, I didn't really expect it to be like a ship without a captain. Right. Yeah. Th that probably is the most surprising thing, right? Cause you're thinking Bioware backed by EA. If it comes to resources, you can't really get, you know, I mean, Certainly, it's one of the top two or three developers and publisher combos out there as far as resources. So you'd think that any of those issues, they're not the ones that would experience them. And it's almost a real shame because I feel like Anthem had such promise. Like there was real, there was a space in the that genre for a game to come along like Anthem and to really either make some waves or fill a gap that other games like Destiny 2 kind of left open. Um, and obviously the result wasn't there, and it's funny or interesting to see how over the first month or so of the game's release, you know, you got a glimpse into some issues there without actually having the behind the scenes. And then, of course, when Jason wrote his piece on it, you suddenly got a lot of information, and there was a lot of people who were very upset with Bioware, specifically public and uh, on Reddit, for example, very upset with the devs and the direction and the changes and their inability to get things done and to the point where people thought the game should be. And then all this behind the scenes information comes out. And it was interesting to me to see how people were actually changing their tone a little bit um, and sort of sympathizing with the developers and some of the challenges that they faced. Sure. Did it almost humanize that a little bit more? I know that's strange to say when it comes to Reddit, because Reddit can be very harsh, but I actually saw people apologizing to Bioware devs publicly saying, you know what, if only we had known, we wouldn't have been so hard on you. That's kind of the thing, though. Maybe we should stop yelling at people like that in general because we don't know what we don't know. That's my favorite saying these days. We don't know what we don't know. And there's always more to the story than what we see on the surface. Like what is presented to us, the public, from a PR perspective or from a final product is nothing. It's like 1% of the story. Um, so when we're screaming at developers, and I don't mean we, the three of us, you know, because I think we try not to do that, but when people are screaming at developers, they don't have a clue. They just, they're doing it. Um, and then it's weird to me that we get to this point. What I found interesting was that I'm pretty quick to, you know, kind of look at EA as the big bad machine sometimes. And I try not to do that um, as much as my younger years, like maybe my early thirties or something. Um, but this came off to me as I get the sense that EA wasn't really the problem here. Maybe I'm not getting that right, but this seemed like a pretty, um, like an internal thing to Bioware, like Bioware leadership. Like, yeah, EA was there, they oversaw it, and they had input, and they may have not liked it, the direction of something or another, but it really felt like this was like a leadership issue on site kind of thing for Bioware, not really like something that um, EA was necessarily had its hands around as much. And I don't, like, I read the entire piece, and I just didn't get the sense that there was like, some EA overlord that was screaming at people to work hundreds of hours and things like that, you know? Right. And, you know, you two and myself, like, we all work in tech. And, and now that I'm saying that out loud, I don't even know if this relates to tech so much as working. But at least for me, you tell me if you agree, my most miserable working experiences have been when I'm asked to pull something off and the people above me don't really know what they're asking for. And that's exactly yeah. what this sounds, this, it's exactly what was documented here. Yeah, no, I 100% I, I agree. And the other thing about this is that um, I'm weird. So this isn't a complaint on my part. Um, I have been known to put in 17, 18 hours in a day for weeks on end. Um, and there's almost like a pride that I have that I can do it, that I can, I can survive it. And um, it's not something that I like to do unexpectedly. It's not something I want to do, as you mentioned, on a project that... Um, is outside of my wheelhouse or something where I'm being asked to deliver something that's not reasonable. But if I am passionate about something, um, then I want to do it. So this idea that people, you know, working very, very long hours, if forced to do that in an ongoing basis with no end in sight, that's awful. Um, but I do believe that there's certainly developers out there 
And I've seen them. I've seen them on Twitter talk about how they work these long hours and they do it because they choose to and they want to. And I think as long as there's people like myself or other people out there that are willing to put in those hours, the, there's going to be a problem because we're always going to get preference over the person that's like, nah, you know what? It's five. I'm done. Like that person's not going to win that, uh, you know, isn't going to get hired over the, the person that's going to want to work or is willing to work that hard or that long. That brings us back to the, the, the ongoing union debate for game devs. Yeah, right. Yeah. And Jason Trier has been quite vocal about that on social media for quite a while. Um, in fact, um, he just, he just wrote a piece. I think it was published in the New York times. If I got that right now, he wrote this before the Anthem and Bioware piece came out, but it is about unionization in game developing circles and, and you're right, because there are people that absolutely don't mind working their entire life and devoting it all to that, but it does make it very difficult for people who want a little bit more of a work-life balance. Maybe they have a family, maybe they have young kids. Um, it's difficult to compete with somebody <clears throat> that's willing to work 16 hours a day. Um, right. And it also breeds sort of a poor culture, because I think in the games industry, more than any other industry, once these folks finish their product and release it into the wild... They're not just done. Like, if I can compare it to the movie industry, for example, you have a lot of people working on the movie, and it gets published and released, and it's out there, but it's done, right? It may be a stinker and terrible. No one's really going to badger Adam Sandler from making yet another movie that's awful. And I'm picking on him in particular for no reason. But, you know, it's finished, whereas a lot of these games... Uh, developers are expected to support them, right? Like, they're ongoing, especially games like Anthem, Destiny 2, The Division 2. Like, they're not just one and done. So you're going to keep hearing from people. You're expected to take in their feedback and adapt to it and respond to it, which puts a lot of folks out into the line of fire of people who are angry, misguided, whatever the reason may be. Like, it's no no secret that there is a lot of power with for people with a lot of voice, even though there may not be many of them, whether it's review bombing on Steam, you know, stuff on Reddit, social media in general, like, it's not easy for developers, I would say. Definitely not. No envy here. Yeah, no, I uh, I imagine it's it's pretty awful. And I mean, we all hear the stories of developers that just won't go on to subreddits or won't go on to Twitter, don't have social media, that kind of thing. Um, and I think that just adds to it. Like, imagine being in the work environment. Let's assume for a second that, that what... Um, the um, the Bioware piece is accurate. I think it was something crazy, like 17 sources. I don't remember exactly, yeah, but like um, he talked to a lot of people. And so there's obviously something there. There's That's not nothing, right? That's not just fabricated out of thin air as far as I'm concerned. When you get 17 sources, you're, you're doing your diligence there. Um, so imagine being in that environment whether you know you, where you feel the pressure and you feel like it's a lost cause and then it comes out and then you just get beaten into oblivion on social media like how much worse is that sure right yeah. no payoff right like not only like and that's just it like we look at it and you're like well, the one thing the bioware piece does in a sense um is it looks at this like it's the past it's not the past it happened like it's today it's tomorrow yeah you know, the studio is still there and they're still working on things. I think they moved like the Edmonton studio might have been the one that was uh, largely responsible for development pre-release. And I think maybe Texas is kind of picking that up post-release. But Bioware is still a place where people are going to work tomorrow. And um, I've I've heard that it's maybe a little better off and I've seen uh, that they've perhaps addressed this and they're going to they're going to take care of it. And hopefully that's correct. But you know, when we talk about this as like a thing that happened, it's like, no, this war is still going on. Yeah. And it's not like, it's not one of those situations where you can just say, well, we've made an adjustment to the policy and everything's fine now. Um, no. It was clearly bigger. But I think the, the correct first step in this was that Bioware at a high level acknowledged that these issues are real. I think that was about the extent of their public statement. I mean, their initial one was just a total misstep where they said there, there was an internal memo telling their employees not to talk to the press, which, of course made it out to the press and made Bioware look even worse. But I think the last thing that they basically said is, yes, these are real problems and we're going to work on addressing them. So if nothing else, hopefully it helped expose some of these and will result in some changes going forward, not just at Bioware, but elsewhere as well. Yeah, it, it needs to, because we, we heard the same thing about uh, Rockstar and Red Dead 
um, in its lead up was that it was high pressure and mentioned in the uh, in the Bioware piece was how um, The Last of Us, which shocked me, was in a very similar state as uh, Anthem leading up to its release, and then they just kind of pulled it off. Um, and that really threw me off guard. So that was kind of my uh, confirmation that this is this is not a, a this is not a Bioware problem. This is an industry problem. Mm -hmm. And to your point, what if Anthem had been great? Would we ever have heard any of this stuff? Maybe not, right? Probably. I don't know if we would have, but they addressed that too in the article, saying that like they almost needed this to happen, you know, mm -hmm. um, because Bioware had a habit of pulling it uh, out of their butt, so to speak, um, and they like the bioware magic was a term they use where they just kind of pull it all together at the last second and a great game comes out and apparently that happened with uh dragon age um and they they i think that like a lot of the individual developers maybe felt like they needed the floor to sort of fall out from underneath them before that something like this could happen I'm curious do you guys think that there is um some of this pressure is also unduly put on developers and publishers by the consumer like, are people expecting too much of these games these days? I know this may be a, a rabbit hole to go into, but just curious what you think. Isn't that sort of the genre that the developer has chosen to be a part of? Games as a service, you know, that that's probably too broad a term, but these looter shooters that, you know, I, I guess Destiny is the first main one. I know Warframe was referenced a lot. I never played Warframe. But if you're choosing to get involved in that space, they're... There is an expectation, and also it is a uh, one that you're aware of in advance, right? True. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Now, I think the first thing that I was trying to communicate is, and, and it may be my personality where I'm not looking for a game to be my savior for the end of t until the end of time, but I think if you're a kid and you can buy one game a year, that prospect is like tantalizing, right? Mm-hmm. And, and you're probably also the person that has, is unscrupulous and, you know, uninhibited on Twitter. And maybe that's the audience that's like so vocal and so, uh, you know, ruthless um, in their criticism. Yeah, I, uh, you're right about that in one way, because the term I've heard before that these games are asking you to be married to them. Um, mm -hmm. Destiny certainly did, does, um, and Anthem as well. Like it wanted to be the game that you're going to play every day for the next, you know, foreseeable future. That's how it was designed. So I guess I can see that when, you know, my problem is sort of the opposite. I have too many games and not enough time. Um, but yeah, I suppose for the, the gamer that wants to be married to Anthem and is then terribly let down when it isn't close to what was expected. Right. And, and I think I would posit, like, what sort of legitimate chance does any game have of pulling that off? You know, again, like Warframe... I mean, I remember I popped in Warframe the day it came out and played for like an hour, and I was like, oh, "What the heck is this thing?" I had like the worst <laughs> reaction possible to a to a fresh experience. Diablo three comes out, pretty much universally agreed upon that that was a bad launch, right? Destiny one comes out, bad launch. Destiny two, I guess, was a fine launch if I remember. But it's like, yeah, it comes with the territory that. Man, this must be so hard to pull off. Why would there ever be an expectation that when Anthem comes out, man, they're going to get it right? Yeah, Bioware of all, uh, Bioware, Bioware. They have no pedigree for this sort of thing. I, I would, I would, I would be shocked to find anybody that was super confident that you know this was the Destiny killer or the des you know the other Destiny or something like that. It, it, I was predicting that Anthem was going to flop, but not because of this at all. I didn't think that it was just going to be an awful game. Um, and I don't say that lightly, but I mean, it's kind of universally thought of, at least at, when it came out as an awful game. Um, I, but I expected, I expected Anthem would tail off. I thought it would probably be well-received. I thought it would be better than it was, but I didn't think that... I almost think that a lot of developers don't understand what it takes to hang in this genre. The, Bungie does get it. Exactly. And there was an entire segment about the gun feel i don't know if that's the term they used but man destiny feels great and it feels yeah. it has so much variety right and when i finally yeah. got that um god it's been a long time since i played when i finally got the marksman rifle whatever they're calling it that i liked it was so distinctly different from thorn from anything from you know some shotgun you get 
some green shotgun that you get. So distinct, <laughs> right? And you can't stumble into that. <laughs> you know, like that that wasn't an accident. That is math. It's two decades of gun experience in digital form. Like th- yeah, really it's bold largely move getting involved in this. It's largely thought of to have amazing mechanics with gunplay, and it does. And it, we know this because we don't complain about it, and we would if it if it didn't. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll complain about it a little bit later on, but well, you but not the actual feel of the gun. Not the feel I don't think. of the gunplay. No, right. that's true. I'll complain about um, the loot. My the reason I thought Anthem was doomed was because I was, and I'm blaming this on on what I assume EA would do, which is that I thought that it would tail a little bit. And EA would look at it strictly from a numbers perspective and be like, not where we want it, pull the plug. That's what I thought would be Anthem's down. Right. Um, whereas Bungie, it doesn't, like if Bungie has a bad year, and look, they had a pretty bad nine months with uh, 2018, maybe six months. There was no question that they were going to keep running on this train. There was no fear that they were going to abandon it because they are committed to that genre. And I think that's where... Um, a game like Anthem, I'm like, eh, I don't know if it's going to make it. Um, I know we're kind of off, but you know, that's that was my concern with it a little bit was that I just didn't think the commitment that was needed. Um, and at it, the same time, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say it honestly would have been great for me personally, and probably for you in some ways as well, if Anthem had been a lot of fun for about 50 hours, and then that was the end of that. Yeah, that would have been fine. And I think that you know they probably would have been a lot more successful if they had have aimed for that. Um, but but what's you know, I understand what they're going for. Like, you know, they always talk about Joe. You mentioned the term "destiny killer," and that's been brought up in the past by different developers. You know, ever since Destiny became what it is, um, I, I feel like people at Bioware, and this was also in the article, right? It's like they almost wanted to step too far the other way, where they're saying like, "We don't want to be compared to Destiny," but it also resulted in literally saying. Don't compare to Destiny. Don't look at their flaws. Don't you know? Don't even talk about Destiny Two, which obviously was a terrible decision because I, I don't know how you can design something to compete with something and not look at the, your competitor and see you know look at the weaknesses because there are definitely weaknesses in Bungie's game. Look at what um, look at what Epic is doing in Fortnite this week. And tell me that it's a bad idea to look at your competitors. Do you, does that, like, are, are we aware of what they're doing? I, I'm Do I not, need to, but is it the ping system you're talking about? Or is it uh, no, the respawn bus. Like, they're, they're essentially oh, taking yeah. the parts of, of Apex Legends that people love, and they're implementing their own version of it in their own game, because, and this is something that I think people should do openly, like developers should do openly, is if somebody else does something that's incredible and works well and people want it, like, you know, you're going you're gonna to release your own version of that. That's how we have 900 Battle Royales to begin with. Yeah, I think people would have forgiven Anthem for failing just on the face of not being good enough to compete with Destiny 2, but in the way that it, it was built and designed and, and sort of these arbitrary rules that it were implemented from the top down, it just it was doomed to begin with, really. So Yeah. yeah. Hopefully in that podcast, can be avoided. We should talk about that. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, uh, in another podcast, we should talk about the idea that um, it's weird to be sold something, and then to look behind the curtain after it's sold and go, wow, would have been nice to know that, you know? Well, if we had known that, that I, makes sense? I certainly would have canceled my pre-order. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's an interesting conversation to have at some point for sure. Um, I kind of, if you guys are okay, I'd like to switch topics a little bit to Please. what I would consider my top story. And, and I'm doing this intentionally because uh, a game was announced that had been teased for probably over a year now in various forms used to go by the name Project Right. Was it Right? White? Um, anyways, if you if you follow David Goldfarb on Twitter at all, he used to be a, you know one of the guys behind Bad Company over at DICE years ago, and they've been working on this with their small studio over in Sweden for a while, and they finally released the, uh, the name of the game, including, what, 15, 16 minutes of gameplay footage? Did you guys watch that at all? No, treat me like, like the audience member. I don't know a dang thing. Same. Okay. All right, so... It's called Darkborn, and it is basically a monster type of game, but you play from the perspective of the monster. So the the gameplay that was uh, released all over the internet uh, on April 2nd, so like a week ago now, uh, basically shows it's a first-person game. You play as a young monster whose parents, monstery parents, but still, you know, parents were basically murdered by Vikings for all intents and purposes. And 
it's up to you now. You're going to be seeking revenge and growing up and going through mysterious oh. things. There's a mysterious voice through the gameplay video. But basically, the entire idea behind it is that you play as the monster, not just the bad guy, but the monster that is, you know, typically on the other side of of the sword. Can I can I cut you off and ask? Is this the thing that has been teased, where you're like schmiggling around? You're, you know. Yes. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, like, like yeah. six months ago or longer, there was like a couple of short clips of this monster thing sort of jumping off and, you know, floating down yeah. towards some Vikings. Yeah. That's what that is. Awesome. And I find it especially intriguing because for one, it's it, it's very different from, you know, the big Anthem type things because we just talked about that. Like this isn't the big game that asks you to be married to it. It feels like this could be a really cool storytelling game where you can get into it and... Uh, really embrace sort of the other side of most fantasy stories where, you know, like if you compare it to The Witcher, for example, you know, you're all about hunting monsters. And here you see the other side of what happens when you, as The Witcher, if Geralt kills a monster, what happens to that monster's babies? Which is an what interesting... What happens to that yeah, monster's Bill? baby? Yeah, like there's it. probably a little monster child sitting somewhere that discovers its parents brutally murdered by Geralt That's... and, you know... That's why you're supposed to use your signs and destroy the egg nest. But anyway, um, <laughs> how, how defensive we, does Bill, you know, I'm new to this scene, right? How defensive does Bill get on the topic of The Witcher? Like, Bill, how offended are you right now? Oh, not at all right now. <laughs> um, but but uh, The Witcher depends. 3 does yeah. rank very high on Bill's list of anything. Oh, really. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it does, so... I, we will eventually get to a point where I am defensive about it. Too. We're just not there right now. Okay. Um, I'm curious. What kind of a game is it? Single player, co-op, multiplayer, that whole live thing? Like, no, it looks like it will be sort of a single player story driven. That's the the gist I get from the from the gameplay footage. Um, so it, it feels more like a game that you're going to sit down by yourself and you know put on your monster hat and and be in that role for a couple hours. Man, see, I, I need a lot more of that in my life. That's, There's not many of those games, is there? No. Well, I mean, there are. you got to know where to look for them. But there's not a lot of, like, there's definitely a shift, obviously, um, to go one way or another um, with either going with that live model or going with single player. But, you know, there's been, uh, well, as we talked about EA, they, they mentioned about how they want to switch over to that live service with uh, their games, and they don't believe single player games are, are there anymore. But... Um, they're definitely there, but I, I just have this place, this special place when I hear of a single player game being announced where I'm far more invested in that right from the get go than I am a live service game usually. Yeah. It sort it, of it does like certainly a, offer something different. Um, it sort of has like a, like a sinuous sacrifice, like a, like a Hellblade vibe in terms of, um, scope. Is that, is, I think that's what I mean. Like. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, we we really, I mean, the 15 minutes of gameplay footage was basically, it, it looked like it was near the beginning of the game, right? You first get awareness as this monster and find out what's happened to your family and you take your first steps at seeking revenge. And so it's hard to, you know, there's not many more details beyond that, but it's very intriguing. And it, it has that... Um, it has the vibe or the feeling, the atmosphere, I guess. It, that's probably the best way to say it. It has an atmosphere similar to Senua's Sacrifice, which is kind of dark and uh, a little sad, obviously, given the circumstances. And um, also, f- from a, like a development standpoint, it's almost like now this new middle middle tier of like double A, like where it's like triple A quality talent that have sort of downsized, I think, in their careers. That's how this, uh, That's how this reads to me. Um, yeah, I think you get a lot of folks who worked at triple A developers... And cut their teeth there and have a lot of skills and then they want to do the game that they've always wanted right. to do um you know so they're not Goodness. quite indie but they're somewhere in between yeah. that's probably the best games that come out is you've got people with skills and ability now to make their vision come to life in, a, in the game that they've always wanted to build and i was just thinking thank thank goodness that there is a creative passion in game developers that when they make it big on a title like for example like a bad company three or um you know we talk about raf who does the long dark um, or i talk about him anyways uh i believe he did like far cry 3 or something um and they leave and start these studios to sort of like pursue their creative passions and 
quite honestly, like how sad would the gaming space be without those people that kind of abandon, you know, the AAA life and then go try to create something on their own with a smaller studio. And they've, they've produced some incredible games. Imagine if you will, a country and America with universal healthcare and, (laughs) and how that would impact developers that are probably just mostly afraid of not having that that maybe also want to work on creative stuff. I'm half joking. <laughs> yeah, you are half. You're not half wrong, though. You're 100% right. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I see that. Um, yeah, that's heavy, Joe. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm just going to put that back to you. You're going you're to have to carry that ball. <laughs> <laughs> but it is nice to see, because like you said, this is. it seems to be a bit of a trend. You know, we all we know that with the boom of indie games, it's just become easier for smaller studios to publish their work which has led to some really skilled people to, you know, take these steps and and strike out on their own, which is cool. So anyways, I mean, Dark Bo- Darkborn is uh, coming at some point. There was no details on that yet, but I'm excited to find out more, and I'm sure that there'll be a bit more um, teased in the future, maybe at E3, maybe at PAX later this year. So that should be, it should be pretty cool. Looks really good. So the other segment... I'm to watch it. Yes, you should. You really should. Like, just, you know, take the 15 minutes, and I, I think you'd quite like it, actually. I meant to, but you know me. Yeah. The um, Speaking of meant to, uh, the thing that we should talk about on a new weekly segment, or not really new, we, I think we've done it in the past, but we'll call it game time. We're going to talk about what games we played in the past week, and I think I want to start with you, Joe, because um, we should say that Bill and I have basically been playing 99% of the same games the past week, so we're just going to echo each other, so we'll get to that in a second. But I know, Joe, you tried out, um, is it Sekiro? Sekiro, I've heard it pronounced several different ways. Yeah, I know same. you didn't. I, I'm, I just really want you to talk about how far you got into it. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm going to I'm going to pass the ball in about 14 seconds. I I didn't make it anywhere in Sekiro. I I think I was beginning to tell you guys I I have a a morbid interest in everything f- from from software. I I am smitten with uh their marketing. I see the next Dark Dark Souls, you know, game that they're working on and I say, "God, I want to play that." And I just cannot. I cannot play it. And for a multitude of reasons, with the Dark Souls series specifically, um, I'm too scared. And I, <laughs> I don't mean that like I'm shaking and and in fear, but for some reason, there's like a a horror in getting something like you know out of nowhere, something jumping out at me, and I can then not fight that thing. That's my problem with Dark Souls. When I played Bloodborne. Uh, much the same uh, with some added horror. When I played Sekiro, and the reason I wanted to play Sekiro to begin with is that I'm looking at it and I'm saying to myself, finally, a you're the hidden person approach to this kind of game. No one's going to be jumping at me. I'll be jumping on them. So I saw that in the marketing. I saw that in the gameplay trailers. And I said, this is going to be the one. I'm not like some grand champion of video games. I'm not like expecting that i'll dominate the thing but i expected that if i you know put my head down and hunker down on one saturday i could progress through this thing and so what they did in my estimation is they've traded the um you know they, they've afforded you this ability to get the jump on the opponent which is new to their games right that is not typically a a a, a feature of the dark soul series or bloodborne or any of them you're you're the one that's getting um surprised in Sekiro, you can, you know, swing around with your with your uh, prosthetic. You're in the trees above. You're looking down at um, all of your opponents. You can jump off the tree and, you know, target these guys and one hit kill them, right? So they've given you that. And in return, they've asked for, okay, now you're going to have to be so freaking good at this style of game that um, it's going to be just so much harder than what you've experienced in Dark Souls. Now that's I suppose subjective. That's my that's my take. But man, oh man, this was so hard, too hard, and so I didn't make any progress. And I sold it on eBay, so it's gone. Oh, already? <laughs> it's, gone. <laughs> it's gone. Yeah. Nice. Cut straight to the chase. Like that's enough. I I kind of did the same when I tried Bloodborne, which was the first one that I tried of the Dark Souls or the Souls series or From Software's games yeah. in general. And uh, for me, it was just a difficulty thing. And I know people love the difficulty. I'm not one of those people, but. I appreciate it. I think the reason that I'm 
drawn to their games, and I, I got smart because I've only ever bought one of them, and it was Dark Souls Three. Um, is that there's this understanding that they're really well done, like. It may not be your type of game, but I'm somebody who really believes in being part of important conversations um, in gaming. So if something is uh, a big deal, I want to experience it because I want to be able to talk about it. And I think that there's like a responsibility of people in gaming to be able to have those. And I have conversations about important topics. And I fail at this miserably because I don't play lots of stuff I should. But um that's what drew me to dark souls was i just everyone was like it's incredible like if you it's essentially just intuitive and it's uh the way that enemies respond to you is really tough but it's fair and i thought man that sounds intriguing i'm gonna try it i think i made like 57 minutes of dark souls 3 never touched it again um and i bought like the super duper edition that's like 130 dollars or something because that's what i do <laughs> yes. like without yeah, any commit. research yeah, I'm like, this sounds fantastic. Here's $130. Um, and then 57 minutes later, it's literally the the Steam game in my library that uh, costs me the most per minute or something like that. <laughs> so oh, right. um, that's what drew it, me to those kinds of games. But I at least learned from my Dark Souls experience to say their games are not for me. I watch people play them on Twitch, and I love doing that, and I appreciate them. And I will never play it. That's yeah, it. see, I first saw about Sekiro probably at, well, I saw it at E3 last year, and it looks really appealing. And I knew, though, that I wasn't even going to try it because that type of game where you spend hours trying to learn how to defeat a boss, which I, I get, um, that's fine. You know, if you enjoy that, all more power to you. It's just not me. Um but I feel a little sad because I feel like that game actually looked really cool and there would be some interesting story stuff in there. So really what I'm on the hunt for now is a condensed version on YouTube where I can just see everything that happened. And I don't mean the six-hour boss fight in a video. I just want to see like the playthrough that works fine. And I realize that there is one where somebody beats like every boss without taking damage. I don't know if you guys saw that, but there is somebody who finished it, beat every boss yeah, in that game without, take, without getting hit. <laughs> which is insane. But that's not really what I want to see. I, I wish I could just experience the story and w without having to work for it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, it's very much like me and bungee jumping. That looks cool, but I'm just going to watch you do it. <laughs> <laughs> On Twitch. There, there is a whole discussion about uh, the From Software games right now, and it sort of reaches out into the broader discussion of accessibility when it comes to difficulty levels in games. And whether or not, you know, like this game doesn't have an easy setting. There are no other settings. It just is what it is. And there seems to be a real outcry from people who are really into those games that that's the way it should be. And for some reason, ha making it easier or more accessible for people who don't want to take, you know, who, who don't want that challenge somehow diminishes the game. I don't really want to get into too much of a discussion on this, but for me personally, it's kind of sad because if the if there was an easier way to play the game, I would buy it and play it, and I think I would really enjoy it. The Without discussion that, isn't though, really about wanting though, because you said that want an easier way. That's not really what it's about. Um, the discussion that I've seen has been about accessibility um, for people who have any kind of disability yes. that are unable. So that's not a wanting an easy mode. And so my opinions on this are that number one, um, anyone who loves the game at its current difficulty adding accessibility options so that people who don't have a choice like they can't just practice right um yeah anyways add the accessibility option that's essentially my beginning and ending to that is uh add the accessibility option and it's really really easy to say this is what it is and it's art which is amazing because gamers love to say it's art when you know it benefits them and then when it doesn't <laughs> then they don't like to say that but uh, they're like, well, we shouldn't ask developers to change it or add accessibility because it's art. And it's like, yeah, you know, it's really easy to say that when you don't need it. That's kind of where I'm at with it. Like, I have very little patience for the discussion, honestly, because if you, again, like, I, I could go play that game. Joe could go play that game. And Joe could decide that over the next 12 months, he is going to master it. And he will. And he will get past. And he will learn. Thank and you. he will get better. And we have that luxury. That's a luxury. And some people don't have that luxury. 
and to say that they can never experience this because there's a bunch of stuck up people that think that all you know from software games need to be hard and you know what if if somebody with a disability can't play well oh well like uh, i don't have time for that at all yeah i mean so any sort of like black and white opinion on video games really pisses me off first of all like get a life kind of i feel um and, and from a developer perspective if they wanted to maintain that hardcore aspect they could probably just give the difficulty settings like they could leave the way it is now and call that normal and then all the people that are good at it can say like you couldn't even beat it on normal there go ahead go brag but um you know i i have a handicapped sister she is not a gamer by any means um she likes to play wii bowling but if she ever expressed to me that she wanted to play sekiro i would be upset and 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 have to say you're not going to be able to do that anna it's not going to work so if i put that cap on yeah i'm totally for any sort of accessibility and one final thought on that i cannot believe that this game was uh published by activision what i didn't know that what a no, what a weird that. game for them to choose to typically they're blockbuster city right like i cannot believe they chose this one to put out into the world good for them though yeah. it's gotten highly good reviews from people who enjoy it though right like from what i understand it's the well people reviewed. that like this game oh yeah that they're, they're it's very good and and it it, it and it is. It is really good. And this is something, uh, you know, we're going to commit to this podcast and keep doing it. So I know that I'm going to talk about this. I feel very strongly, not necessarily about difficulty on a absolute scale, but I really care about it in the terms of designing a ramp, which is uh, apparently really hard to do because it's so uh, seldom achieved. Like, like a, a smooth ramp where you're taught something... Mm. And you can get to the end of a game, and that end can be tough but fair, but you learned along the way, and that's why you can beat it. That's right. That's really infrequent. Yeah, I can't think of any examples off the top of my head that have done that well. I'm sure that if I stepped away for until next week and thought, I could come up with something, but immediately, no. That's probably a good poll question. It just might be. Yeah. So we'll, we'll remember that. Um so, Bill, you and I, we've been spending most of our last week and probably the week or two before that playing the Division 2, uh, sprinkled in with a little bit of Destiny 2 every once in a while with those uh, Zur, uh, what are they called? Quests? The um, uh, Invitation of invitation. the Nine. Yes. Yeah. So, maybe we start with that real quick, because that is the only thing that I have been jumping into Destiny 2 for in the past four weeks. I believe we're up to the fourth now. I go in there every Friday. I pick up the Invitation of the Nine. I go spend half an hour doing stupid stuff, and then I watch some cool lore. Right. Yes, that has been your okay Destiny I'm okay with that. I, it, I feel... I don't feel the need to do more. No, you shouldn't, but uh, I know you better than you do in this case, I think. I'm going to you probably this, disagree. I? Yeah, yeah, you are. Um... So, yeah, first of all, we have been playing The Division 2, and it has been a breath of fresh air, 100%. Um, and we'll get into it a bit more. But quickly, very quickly on your Destiny, you shouldn't be putting more time into Destiny than that, because this season has been a bit of a letdown, I think. Um, so it's not as if I think that the reason that you're not committing to Destiny is because you're just in general like, eh, I'm moving on to different things, and I'm changing as a gamer. I don't think that's it. I think that... Uh, you have something else to focus on, which is fresh and new, and that's great. But they haven't given you a reason to come back and to actually put in time. And once they do, because you've hated Destiny at times, I've hated Destiny at times, and we've had months off, and then we've had you know months on. And if they create something really cool, like if you know year three kicks off with some huge dlc that is like the taken king you'll be right back on the like 25 hour a week train yeah uh, destiny is my emotionally abusive girlfriend we've oh, yeah. i've said this before it's the it's the one that i can't i can't stand but i can't ever say no to yeah and that's why i put in a little more time than you week to week is because i don't want to play 50 hour catch up um later on and i think you said to me something like if it requires me to grind to catch up i just won't do it i call bs on that we'll it's see. a lie oh, I know. See. it's just okay. I, I i like to think that but what i really want is i would be willing to spend 25 dollars for a catch-up moat that's a rabbit hole that we do not want to introduce <laughs> <laughs> that's just me though didn't they that's have another those, discussion though? we can have at some point like i'm willing to spend money to save time yeah that was the thing at yeah. one point 
Maybe Destiny they 1. They did have that yeah. uh, for one of the year changes in yeah, Destiny. And they kind of had it in Destiny 2 as well from year 1 to 2. But it didn't really go as far as I'd want it to go. It I don't just, think it actually cost money, though. I believe They gave like you one, one for free, but then you had to buy yeah. more. Yeah, so essentially, like, you could just, you could kind of skip to where people are now. Because it could be a bit of a slog. But, but it only put you at the minimum level. I want to go over to the top. Like, I want to... Anyways, well, they, they, that's the one thing they did for this season is they introduced bounties that would essentially catch you up in about two hours. Mm -hmm. So I assume that they'll carry that forward and you'll be able to skip right to that which, point. And which I think that's may good. be why I feel less bad about not reaching like the maximum level right now, the max power for this yeah. season. True. True enough. I should probably take your lead on that, but I'm, I'm dumb. Well... We'll see. We'll see how it goes. I, I'm totally open to the idea that, uh, you know, three months from now, whenever the next season starts, I'm going to hate myself um, because I'll be doing repetitive stuff. But so speaking of repetitive stuff, like it seems like the, the grind in Destiny 2 has been all about, you know, gr obviously grinding power level. And it's more or less the same activities as before that we've done in the past, which I'm tired of. So when we switch to the Division 2, uh, we're getting to the end game now where I guess there is a bit of a grind, but it feels more varied is that a way to put it? I don't know if it feels more varied or if we if it's still just new. Um, mm -hmm. That's my thing. Is that I the mistake that I think I have probably made, and I know that every casual journalist that ever reviewed Destiny Two made was that they reviewed the game before they put a hundred hours into it. Um, and I think the division is similar. I don't think that this is a game that can get reviewed, and it already has been. But I don't think this is a game that can get reviewed in a month. Like you don't know what the real game is until you're out of the new hotness, so to speak. You know what I mean? Like once you once you settle in with those games, now we get to see what it's about. Yeah. Is it interesting? Um, is it repetitive? Uh, the Division Two, and here's the cool thing for me: I love it, but there's a lot of problems with it. But I've chosen not to care. I see people on the subreddit freaking out, like, oh, there's a problem with this damage, like, and they're going into calculations, and I appreciate those people and what they do and their dedication, but I've just chosen not to care. I don't care. I don't care if my gun doesn't do 2,000 damage extra that it should be doing because some stupid error, you know, on the Ubisoft side. I don't care. And that has allowed me to enjoy the game, is that all the little things that would bother me if it was destiny because i'm so invested i've kind of just accepted that the division two is going to be my fling right. and i don't have to care and i it, it's been it's been very nice because i can let things go like oh well my gun's not doing five thousand damage but the enemies are still dying so whatever i don't care yeah and i've uh, you know we've been having a lot of fun with it um we've been playing it we've been making our way through it we've gone after some of the secrets and little gotchas in the game that are not openly you know obvious to gamers but uh, it it does feel a little bit similar to when we played the division the first time around which ironically is probably one of the things we talked about like one or two episodes ago given the two and a half year gap in the push to talk series um but it is it is enjoyable when you don't look too deeply under the covers. I think your concern has always been the staying power of this, and that what, that's what it comes down to, is that I don't know how long we'll be playing this until we stop playing it and just go back to Destiny or something else. Yeah. Um, I always refer to, and whether it's video games or whether it's television shows, I always refer to um, storytelling by building the universe first and the character second, or storytelling by building the characters first and the universe second um and i don't know which one the division is but i know in destiny um i feel like the universe is more important than the characters if that makes sense like you you've done a lot of reading and i i think that they've set that up in a way that there's a lot of storytelling potential there yeah and i think when you build from character outward that you sort of have to keep coming up with interesting characters and it feels fractured what um it's interesting because with a game like the Division 2 or Destiny 2, what keeps me coming back is one of two things. It's either cool stuff and achievements, so that's loot, secret gear, a cool mask or whatever, a cool shader, a nice ship, or something related to the lore of the universe, some some neat story. So the reason I keep going back to Destiny 2 right now are those, like we mentioned, the Invitations of the Nine, because it's related to the lore, and there's no doubt in my mind that Destiny's lore and story is far superior to what's happening in the division um yeah and that's why i that's kind of tying it back in that's what i value the most mm -hmm. um i need to have the parts i need to have the loot the gunplay and everything else but 
I feel like I am connected to the Destiny universe in a way. You know, like yeah. I understand it, I know it, I could talk about it for hours on end. Um, you know, I could I could very horribly explain sword logic, and people are like, "What?" You know what yes. I mean? Um, yeah. But you could read a whole book on that. It would be it's amazing. That's what I'm saying. Is that there's that that's what keeps me going. Is that I have accepted the marriage proposal that Destiny put out. You know, nearly five years ago, um, and it's not every year of the marriage is good, but. <laughs> Overall, we're comfortable. You know, there's some high points. We've had some fancy dinners. Um, with the division, I kind of hope it does, but I feel like where they missed it is that I don't really care about anyone in that game, like yeah. the characters. Like, I can't name one of them, man. I can't name a single character. No, I struggle with that too. Just thinking about that now. What what I I think the division two has uh, superior over Destiny two is the actual loot and things because for me. In Destiny 2, the, the stuff I get, with the exception of very few exotics that I had to grind for to the point where I hated myself, I don't care. It's all just trash that I'm putting on. In the Division 2, at least I get stuff, which is neat. Now, that may that may well end. It just might be that, you know, I've got to what a total of five years or so in the Division universe, and I've kind of had everything that's been to offer. And the Division 2 is new, and there's things there that I can still get. But I guess... I wish that one of these games someday, and obviously Anthem completely screwed the pooch on this, would get both right. The lore and the story, and the loot and the achievements, the progression, the rewards that are rewarding to me. I want to get stuff. I want to do stuff and get stuff. Not do stuff and maybe get something if I'm lucky on the random number generator. I am hopeful that Destiny will get this right. And I wrote about this last week. Um, yes, you did. I believe I forget the exact title, but something along the lines of uh, "The Division Two Expose Exposes Destiny 2's Lackluster Loot Systems" or something like that. Um, over on Shack News, and I agree. Um, that's what I've noticed is that I have to pay more attention to what drops in the division and investigate it. Um, although a week later, after writing that article, um, at this point, gear score is everything in the division two. So I mean where I, you know, I criticize the fact that power rules all in Destiny. Right now, gear score rules all in the Division 2. But I'm hoping that's a temporary thing. Like, as we get to a certain gear score, now there are definitely more options for uh, how you build your characters and the kind of character you want to build. Yeah. Um, my hope is that the people at Bungie, and this is coming, and I'll, I don't know anything about game development, and everything I say here is assumption, I hope they're paying attention because the loot system in Destiny is not good. It's not good. The options are not good. Their entire perk system is based on fixing something that is broken. Instead of fixing what's broken by making it not broken, they're essentially giving you band-aids in the forms of perks. And I think that they're in trouble there. Um, when I see something in Destiny, I don't really care. I'm looking for two perks because there's only two that are worthwhile really that's it and when i'm in the division it's like it's just it's almost overwhelming how many decisions i have to make about my loot and my gear uh and i really love that i don't mind grinding in destiny but give me sort of like give me paths that that, that branch off from from one another so if i have to grind to get 47 of the same item i at least want to know that you know i'm i have impactful decisions to make about that item every time it drops yeah i don't have that right now it's like the same there's a little variation maybe in gun rolls but it's too shallow um mm -hmm. and the division two really exposed that yeah and the last thing that i want to say on this topic it may be that i'm sort of overlooking some of the division two's flaws with loot because when i wear random stuff in that game i still look okay when I wear random stuff in Destiny 2, I look like a homeless guardian that just picked up all his armor out of a trash can somewhere in the city. Yeah, it's that's like, that's definitely a thing. Um, I don't know. So, Joe, have you ever been tempted to play? You, uh, first of all, I guess you'd say you don't really do you play Destiny 2 or something like that, or have you ever been tempted to? Well, okay, a brief history: Taken King, 200, 300 hours, something like that. Um, Destiny 2, 60 hours. I thought it was fine. I thought it was a step backward. I didn't like Crucible as much, and Crucible is my favorite part of Destiny 1. Oh, you're one of those people. Yes. Okay. I was pretty good at it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just like a like a interest in the mechanics part, but I am I am not a grinding 
kind of person. I like JRPGs, but like JRPGs are a hundred hours. They're not a thousand hours, you know? Right. I will say this though, very quickly, as I play destiny these days in the, let's say four to five hours a week max right now. Um, it's almost like I'm playing it the way they wanted, they intended. And it's been pretty good. You know what I mean? Like I'm not worried about being max Mm. power or getting that thing right now or completing that task right now. Like I don't feel like if I don't do it by Tuesday, I failed something and I've enjoyed it quite a bit. So I, I almost feel like the more restraint that I can show and being able to dive into destiny, the better it treats me. Hmm. Interesting point. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm just, I'm sort of like, oh, you know what? Like I'm going to knock out three or four, you know, uh, powerful Engram bounties or something like that. Uh, you know, I'm going to do like, oh, I, I want to pick up this piece of lore that I can only get this week or I have to wait six weeks or whatever. Um, and I do that stuff and, you know, but the minute that I look at something and I go, oh, that seems like work. I just turn it off mm-hmm. and it's been fine. Like I've, I've enjoyed it. I, I loaded it up to do three strikes two or three days ago and I loaded into a strike and I just like, I wanted to throw up thinking about having to go through three strikes and I just shut destiny down and i I don't even know if i went and played something else but i just shut it down and that was it and uh went back to it when there was something i wanted to play so yeah um i think it's a a sign of maturity as a gamer honestly a little bit as well to realize your limits of what you want to do and when you get to that point where like you know what this isn't fun i'll do something else and there's no shortage of options And this actually kind of leads us into our uh, poll for the week in our hashtag push to talk segment where we asked which game made you immediately give up on it. And we sort of grouped them into uh, three categories, one of them being any Souls game, and we've already talked a little bit about that, um, uh, any Battle Royale game, and then for some reason I chose Red Dead Redemption 2 because that was controversial. Nobody really voted for that very much. But I guess what it comes down to is aside from... Uh, the Souls games, which are clearly not for anybody, and we've had some replies of people saying that, you know, they've started that, never really got into it, just moved on. Um, it seems like Battle Royale games are fairly, you know, either hit or miss. Like, people either love them, clearly, like Fortnite and Apex Legends, or they just aren't into them at all. Um, we had a po- couple of people, for example, Jake and Arnold, saying on Twitter that it was Fortnite for them. Uh, for some, they hate it with a passion, even though they love Apex Legends. But for some people, it just wasn't the right type of game. Like the building, I guess, wasn't uh, something that Arnold enjoyed. Mm. Um, H1Z1 or H1Z1 uh, was also mentioned by Adam, which has been a giant disappointment. And I quote: "After a ton of hype, was duped into thinking the transparency of the development translated to a good game, which is an interesting topic as well that maybe we talk about at some point in the future." Um, Do you guys have any, I mean, we sort of talked about, obviously, Dark Souls. Do you have any comments for games that you tried and completely dismissed because you just didn't like it? I mean, I do. (laughs) I think we started this, this, uh, like, brainstorming for for rebooting the show, right, and saying how cynical we all are, so (laughs) I'm hesitant to, like... (laughs) <laughs> on on day one to get too transparent but i'll say i'll say this i'll try and encapsulate it a little bit for the sake of like not going off on an enormous tangent the re- resurgence of the 2d um indie metroidvania genre of which i feel there is just copious uh options if you like hollow knight um uh, of course i can only think of one right now but i feel like if you boot up <laughs> there's lots like this one and you know all the others uh, axiom verge um uh, ori in the blind forest um i'm sure if you gave me ample time i could think of them but it's all good you already named three i only know one of them so you're good okay i anytime i see like in an opening sequence there's like a door that can't be opened with my current skill set oh i'm gonna have to come back here oh my god that's the immediate over overwhelming drowning. I mean, and and uh, what are we talking like sixteen hours max for the whole thing? Doesn't matter. It's just like a like a total total buzzkill for me. So that's my answer. Interesting. I think for me, it like when Apex Legends launched uh, a month or so ago, um, there was a lot of good press around it. A lot of great game. I installed it. A lot of great coverage. I meant to say. I installed it. I haven't launched it. Because I think by the time I finished installing, I decided, you know what? I actually don't like these kind of games anymore. Mm-hmm. I don't want to play the game where I have to, you know, get together with a couple of friends, which is great. I, I almost exclusively like playing games with 
friends in a co-op style, but I don't like the competition of it anymore. I don't want to run around, get shot, and repeat. Just, I think that's me. I used to do that stuff. It's, you ago. know, it's like League of Legends, and and I, I was big on League of Legends in the early days. Um, it reminds, Apex and, and like the, the, the Fortnite, you know, trend recently has reminded me of, of that feeling of, I'm going to sit down, this thing could go an hour, or it can go five minutes, and um, that sort of variance in playtime that not everybody can accommodate that like i can't i can't sit here uninterrupted i'm married i'm i have a uh, i'm expecting a child i i have work right like i can't sit down and like don't talk to me for 60 minutes straight i'm about to be the uh the chicken dinner whatever the whatever the term is <laughs> i I, I don't think you're the chicken dinner <laughs> I, I think you get a chicken dinner or but i also if you're don't second know. place your chicken dinner i believe <laughs> But yeah, that's a good point, actually. The timing thing is, is a big thing for me. Not so much that I can't take an hour, because God knows I can several at times. I like being able to say, okay, you know what? I'm going to play for X amount of time and be somewhat reasonable in my estimation of that. Yeah, yeah. Not one of those open-ended things where it's like, I want to start this. I don't know. It might take 10 minutes. Could take, you know, two and a half hours. Sure. And, you know, my, my uh, League of Legends time was, you know, I would, what is, that came out 09, 2010 or something. I was in college. I was ending college and I was able to do that and I just can't do that anymore. So for me, this, this type of genre, just like, I, I just feel like I'm too old for it. I don't even like technically dislike it. Apex is like, I, I played for like an hour, cumulative. Apex is awesome. Like it's super well made launch day. It was like rock solid servers were perfect. I was like, this is incredible. No one pulls this off. Respawn's awesome. By the mm -hmm. way, I love respawn. Titanfall yeah. is outstanding. Um, that's why I wanted to play Apex. Yeah, no, no, no. And, and if you're, if you're looking at what you've seen and saying that looks really good, it is really good. But for me, it's still like the best battle Royale. And that's just not, it's just not for me. No, I agree. Uh, that's, I, I think I was the one that, uh, probably encouraged Jan to download. And I, I think I even said like, we're probably not going to play this very much, but we should give it a shot. And the reason that I wanted to give it sh a shot is because I felt like, I'm weirdly attached to the idea that if a company does something right, they should be rewarded. Totally. And I thought that Respawn had done it right. And in this case, you know, with as a publisher, EA had done it right. There was no slogging through two years of awful um, early access and hype and this and that and back and forth and like constant patches. Like there are going to be patches, but they were just like, hey, here's an awesome game. It's out now. Enjoy. And it really just was an awesome game that was out now. And I thought that is how it should be done. And we should kind of like encourage that behavior. Sure. <laughs> um, but I never played it. I'm, I'm, I'm both. So when you say like, is it Souls games or is it Battle Royale? 57 minutes in Dark Souls 3. And then I was out. Uh, and in terms of my Battle Royale experience, I think Jan and I might have played like 10 rounds of h1z1 maybe 10 yeah the battle royale variant yeah yes we played a lot of the pve survival stuff but mm -hmm. maybe 10 rounds of the battle royale i logged into PUBG. i spawned i floated to the ground in my parachute but what i really did was take the hud off or however you take a screenshot i don't remember now i took a hudless screenshot for an article i was writing um, landed on the ground and thought, well, I might as well finish the round. And then I just kind of stood there and looked around and was like, nah. And I exited the game and I never played another battle Royale ever. Like, I just like you guys. It's not for me. Yeah. I like watching people. Um, Anthony Kong fan is one of my absolute favorite streamers. I watch him all the time and he plays apex legends, probably 75% of the time on his stream these days. And I will watch him play it. And I am thoroughly entertained and that is how I will enjoy it. Yeah. More power to you. Yeah, I think that's smart. I mean, I guess we all just... I, I, that's, I guess, the one nice thing about all this great variety of games we have these days is that, you know, if you can't enjoy a specific game, move on to something else because there's something out there for everybody. I, I, you know, I say this sometimes, and I go through these phases where I'll go like, I don't know what to play. There's nothing I want to play, which is silly because there's definitely something I want to play. I just, I'm not looking hard enough. There's so much variety. Absolutely. But... Yeah, I definitely feel that way myself, but but we're definitely both wrong in feeling that way. Yeah, it's like it's the Netflix thing, right? Like you've got four hundred things on your, you know, my list and nothing to watch. So it's 
speaking of Netflix, at some point we need to talk about Google Stadia as well. I feel like we should have started restarted the podcast about a month earlier. We decided <laughs> to do it sort of right after GDC, but there'll be much more to talk about in the uh, future episodes. And I think we're probably at the time now where we should wrap this up for the first episode in over two and a half years. Um, I want to thank the folks who actually kept following us on Twitter and kept an eye on what we've not been up to and were able to see us come back. So for those of you listening, thank you. And if you're not sure how to follow us online, if you just found us randomly on iTunes, you can find us at pushtotalk.fm on the web or at pushtotalk.fm on Twitter. And you can also send us an email at info at pushtotalk.fm. Basically, we're going to be doing the hashtag push to talk segment every week. So tomorrow I will be we're recording this on Sunday. I'll be putting up a new poll on Twitter. So we'll be looking for your input on that. And then we'll mention some of your responses in the next episode. Any parting words from either of you two, Bill, Joe? Be healthy. <laughs> be healthy and safe. I am out of words. Perfect. First time ever. First time ever. We'll see how long that lasts. We will catch everybody again next week. Thanks so much for tuning in. 